Yama, who is the ambassador of Japan to South Africa, and then also to recognize the ambassadors, high commissioners, and heads of missions of various diplomatic missions to South Africa, as well as officials from the South African Department of International Relations and Cooperation. And the audience members, we have we have quite a, a full house um, today. The audience members who hail from the worlds of business, academia, the voluntary sector, and women's empowerment groups. Allow me to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this webinar on closing the gender gap in economic participation, perspectives from Japan and South Africa. I am Scarlett Cornelison. I'm a professor at the Department of Political Science at Stellenbosch University. Today's webinar is hosted by Stellenbosch University in association with the Embassy of Japan in South Africa. And today's webinar follows a series of collaborations in hosting webinars between the two parties over the past couple of years. Today's topic, which is in a nutshell, is about um, women's economic empowerment, but it involves a lot more. It's about the inclusion of women in the workplace. It's about gender equity in employment and the contribution that gender inclusivity makes to national growth. So today's topic is both, um, I would say, topical and recurring. It is topical since we are only a few days away from celebrating International Women's Day on the 8th of March. This day, International Women's Day, marks global society's efforts to celebrate the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women in the world. And it also at the same time, this International Women's Day recognizes that there is still some need, some, some work that needs to be done to achieve women's equality in all domains of uh, global life. As an aside, I was, I was quite in, intrigued to learn that the first International Women's Day um, gathering was held in 1911. In other words, um, 111 um, years ago. So, so in that light, um, when I say that the topic of today is both topical and recurring, the topic for me is, is also recurring um, in, in the sense that it comes to attention time and time again. Uh, this is when, when one sits back and reflects about what actual progress um, has made towards women's um, empowerment, especially in the economic domain. So uh, since at least the 1970s, uh, studies have suggested that lack of participation by women in the economy negatively affects the generation of human capital with spillover effects on labor markets and productivity. So as a result, addressing gender disparity has been a key focus of the global governance agenda for the past um, four to five decades. Gender equality, for example, is one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and it was also part of the earlier uh, Millennium Development Goals. Yet, despite this, gender inequality remains a challenge in many parts of the world. To give you a few examples, uh, in 19, in, uh, excuse me, in 2016, this is the, the most recent um, that, that I could um, uh, get hold of, a report by the UN High-Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment suggested that in 2016, there were globally 700 million women um, of working age, fewer women of working age than men in employment, and that those women who were employed tended to be in jobs with lower pay, poor working conditions, and fewer career prospects compared to men. And currently, there's evidence that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women um, uh, and men, uh, so, so that the negative burden of the, the, the uh, COVID pandemic was uh, felt more by women than by men. And this is largely due to the, the, the burden of, um, the greater burden of unpaid care um, uh, that uh, women uh, tend to carry. And women's employment has fallen in the COVID era. Estimates are that following COVID, that to close the gender gap, um, it, will, it, uh, it will take more than um, uh, 136 years. So, so closing the gender gap has been set back by a full generation as a consequence of um, uh, the COVID pandemic. It is against this background that we have invited experts from South Africa and Japan to discuss the progress 
and obstacles towards economic inclusivity and women's um, empowerment in the workplace. I must say, uh, at first glance, Japan and South Africa don't compare easily. Japan is a leading economy in the Asia Pacific as well as globally. And Japan has a distinctive gender culture uh, that's rooted in its very deep um, civilizational history. South Africa has gone some way towards gender equality in the political domain in the post-apartheid era. But we in South Africa face um, severe societal and structural problems, for example, um, uh, gender-based violence. But yet there are insights that can be gained um, from these two contexts of Japan and um, uh, South Africa. We have a, a stellar lineup of distinguished and formidable speakers um, with us um, this morning, and, and I will be introducing all our speakers um, one by one. Um, first things first, let me hand over to His Excellency Mr. Norio Mariyama, Ambassador of Japan in South Africa, for a welcome and opening remarks. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Anna, Professor Kornelissen. Uh, it is such a pleasure for me to say a few words on this occasion. Uh, I am delighted uh, that Stellenbosch University is hosting this webinar. Uh, we are such distinguished speakers of South African people about Japan's current situations around and um, efforts uh, towards achieving gender equality. On this occasion, I would like to introduce some of the recent programs uh, that we have implemented uh, for women's empowerment in South Africa uh, during the lockdown. And as a COVID-19, Japan, together uh, with UN Women, promoted uh, the leadership, access, empowerment, and uh, protection of uh, women and girls through a variety of the measures. And together with the UNDP, Japan supported an inclusive and multi-sectorial response to COVID-19 and address um, its socioeconomic impact in South Africa uh, through the implementation of projects and we expect vulnerable women. JICA's project also responds uh, to the need of uh, empowering uh, women in South Africa. Uh, the project uh, for the promotion of empowerment of persons with disabilities and uh, disability mainstreaming is helping women uh, giving care to those people. Uh, smallholder horticultures and empowerment uh, promotion is also empowering women in the family. And uh, women living in economical uh, disadvantaged areas receive skill development um, training uh, and uh, artisan development project that we are doing at the uh, Tibet colleges. So and, uh, Japan is um, committed to women empowerment. We will continue to support women in South Africa. I hope uh, this webinar uh, contributes to your better understanding of the situation around achieving gender equality in Japan and South Africa. I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Professor Esther Klopper and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Strategy, Global and Corporate Affairs at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which is a collaboration between our university's Department of Political Science and Stellenbosch University International. In particular, we are honoured to have with us His Excellency, Mr. Norio Mariyama, the Ambassador of Japan to South Africa, who's joining us. Our esteemed speakers today uh, includes Ms. Kaohori Sasaki, who is the founder and the CEO of eWomen Incorporated and leadership champion of the World Bank Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative. We also have Stellenbosch University Professor Tuli Madonsella, who has been the former public protector of South Africa and currently holds 
a chair in the Faculty of Law in Social Justice. And then we also have with us Dr. Futi Mtoba, who is the founder of Teach South Africa and chair of the Council of the University of Pretoria. And last but not least, uh, joining us is Professor Mashuku Osava, who is a professor emeritus of the economics of economics at the Japan Women's University and former director of the Research Institute for the Women's and Career. So on behalf of Stellenbosch University, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the speakers and delegates this morning at this webinar that intends to tackle a very important global issue. And as the title reads, closing the gender gap in economic participation. And this will bring both perspectives from Japan as well as South Africa. These webinars confirm the importance of Stellenbosch University's collaboration with Japan through our long-standing partnership and the joint work in the area of research, student exchange, staff exchanges between our university and universities in Japan with the support of the Embassy of Japan. Our topic today is a pertinent global issue that is in need of addressing a time that we seriously consider the impact on COVID, of COVID specifically on this theme. But more so because much progress has been made in ensuring and advancing women's participation in all aspects of society. The gender gap remains. And today we will explore that in terms of women's economic participation. So this webinar is also significant because International Women's Day will be celebrated next week on Tuesday the 8th of March. And although we celebrate the achievement of women, we should also reflect on what work still needs to be done to achieve the equality for women globally. I'm particularly inspired to hear about women economics, which is aimed at increasing the number of women in the Japanese workforce and improving their salary levels as well as working condition. Japan has seen tangible results because of this program, and I indeed think it's exemplary for other countries to follow in similar initiatives. In South Africa, the drive to advance the participation of women in especially the workforce and other fields of the economy came at a time when a new democratic South Africa began to take shape in 1994. What we have seen are several policies that has been developed that enable the empowerment of women. And that drives continually today to create policies and concrete means of ensuring women's economic participation. However, we still need to see an improved uptake of these policies and frameworks. Today, women make up 46% of the members of the South African National Assembly or the Parliament. But at a provincial level, according to the National Council of Provinces, it still lies at about 36%. And although we've seen increases since 2019, according to the Parliamentary Monitoring Group, we indeed hope to see that this will further increase on provincial level. Along with the massive impact that COVID-19 pandemic has had on global economies, we have also seen that women has in many cases been suffering at the hand of the pandemic. We have seen this in various occupational fields, within the health sector being my own professional field, I've seen how the pandemic 
has impacted our women. In academia, we have also seen the impact of the pandemic on women. In January this year, an article published in Science Direct reported that the statistic shows a precipitous decline in women's scholarly productivity during the pandemic. This study also found that the decline is due to the increase in teaching and administrative workloads, but indeed coupled with the traditional family roles women play while working from home. It's almost been a double whammy. But it's also not only women in health and academe that have suffered the brunt of the pandemic. In, a, in general, in a McKinsey report found that at the beginning of the pandemic, that women's jobs are 1.8% more vulnerable than those of men during a crisis. And one of the reasons is that women carry a disproportionate burden of unpaid care in society. So colleagues, this conversation today is especially necessary during this time so that we can explore the many challenges women face globally, especially when it comes to opportunities in the workplace and safeguarding them. A space in the economies of the world. We are glad to have in our midst the leading experts that can guide our discussion today and guide our thinking about the economic empowerment of women in our different contexts and also explore how especially policies can impact and advance women across all different dimensions. To get us to that point, we have to look at the challenges and how we can ensure the solutions are what needs to be in the future. This webinar is one of the platforms that will help us to advance towards bridging the gender gap in economic participation. And I hope that you would find this session an enriching experience and that these reflections will aid us to make a global impact in closing the gender gap for women in economic empowerment. Enjoy the session. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cornelison. Um, colleagues, uh, participants, panelists, speeches, speakers, um, it's really nice to see a, a big group of um, participants in this webinar um, with such a really, really important topic. Um, as Professor Cornelison has indicated, um, we over the last few years we've we've done a few webinars um, in collaboration with the Japanese embassy um, and and consulate. And th this type of collaboration is really strategically very important um, for for our, um, uh, our, our our office specifically. I also just want to highlight that. At the University of Stellenbosch University, at Stellenbosch University, we have um, in 2019 implemented a policy of comprehensive internationalization. Now that policy um, includes various different dimensions, um, among other engagement dimension, student dimension, research dimension. And these webinars that we are presenting in collaboration with the Japanese consulate um, is really enforcing those dimensions. Also, something else that I think is really, really important for us to highlight um, that we believe in terms of practitioners of comprehensive internationalization is that topics like, for example, women economic empowerment is not just a local problem, but it is a global problem. Um, and um, and issues regarding gender equality, uh, women empowerment, for example, cannot just be addressed through local efforts, but it needs to be addressed through global efforts. And so for us, um, this webinar um, is really for us uh, uh, an example of 
uh, what can be done through comprehensive internationalization and, 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 and collaboration. And so we are really looking forward um, to, to see the outcome of this web webinar. And I would also just like to thank um, the colleagues, uh, Professor Cornelissen and Lydia, that have really worked quite hard to put this webinar together, as well as staff um, from the Japanese embassy. Um, and on that point, I would like to hand over to Scarlett. Thanks, Scarlett. Thank you very much, uh, Sewa. And thank you for stepping in on behalf of Professor Klopper. Now for the main part of um, our program, and we are very honored to um, start with an opening address by Ms. Kaori Sasaki. Um, her opening address is entitled Closing the Gender Gap in Japan. Now, when I when I used the word formidable, a formidable um, lineup of speakers, I, I meant it. Um, so Ms. Sasaki is a well-known diversity expert, a best-selling author, and a sort of the commentator, and she appears regularly regularly in the Japanese um, media. Since 1996, Ms. Sasaki has produced and chaired the International Conference for Women in Business, which is the largest diversity conference in Japan. Ms. Sasaki opened the first portal for women in Japan in 1996 and founded um, eWomen um, Incorporated, which is a diversity consultancy that provides marketing, branding, product development, and training to major corporations. So Ms. Sasaki has, has a, an illustrious um, CV. Um, she was a reporter. Um, she traveled to over 25 um, countries to report on human rights and other international topics um, for the highest rated um, news program, News Station. Um, and she anchored for CBS um, in Tokyo. She has served as advisor to numerous government ministries in Japan, as well as um, the World Bank. And she has been on the boards of directors of a number of major Japanese uh, corporations. We are really privileged to have Ms. Sasaki um, spend time with us today and uh, to tell us about closing the gender gap in Japan. So I hand over to you, Ms. Sasaki. Thank you very much, and then very, very honored to uh, to be invited. In fact, that the other uh, South Africa is one of my favorite countries that I visited. And then um, today, I would like to use the other uh, PowerPoint, some of the photographs and some of the keywords. And then for the, well, the next thirty minutes, that I'd like to kind of like give some thoughts and ideas and what's going on in Japan and what I have been watching and then doing. So um, next, please, that the, um, the slides next, please. I think that you have already. Well, that while you're preparing, I was going to, uh, to show some of the photograph of the reporting because that the other that shows that where I visited and also like I visited South Africa. The the re one of the 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 report I did in well I visited South Africa twice actually. That the uh, the uh, the during the apartheid and I have met and interviewed and um, with the. Mr. Mandela, and then um, when he visited Tokyo, I was attending him as well. And then uh, in Johannesburg, um, I got um, once gunshot, and then and, and get up, had the operation to take my bullet out from my leg. Um, yes, could you turn the page? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so could you? So the, these are the photograph of the this to just to start with. So those are the places that I visited. And next page, please. And then this is the Philippines. Yep. And then next, please. And this is one of the photos, um, some of the photos from South Africa at the time that when I visited. The next page, please. And this is the other uh, where that I was covering the other uh, demonstration of NAC, ANC, and then Inkata in uh, the Soweto, and then uh, I got gunshot in, in hospital. And this is a profile, but the other, could you turn the page? 
Next page, please. Yes, that. So I I would like you to know who I am. So that the first is the, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm the uh, the second is a created the first business women's network and conference. Next, please. An international conference for women in business, as she uh, the kindly introduced. Yes, please turn next page. And these are the photographs from the next page, please. The from the conferences that the prime minister um, attended, and many ministers attended every year. And then it's a very international. It's ten hour uh, conference for last thirty years, and then it's the largest diversity conference in Japan. And then uh, we've been uh, switching it on to online so that actually more than 1000 people from all over the world access for this conference every year uh, then uh, next please then um, um the, i'm also the, the, uh, the i started the very first website for women in japan that was 1996 now called a woman and then next please and then the other, as I was introduced, that Diana, the government council members and TV commentator and speakers. Thank you. And next, please. And then I'm the diversity expert. I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity index later, but uh, this is something that I invented to close the gender gap. Next, please. And then I'm also uh, sitting on boards for the uh, four listed companies at this moment. Uh, list. And then um, I'm creating also a network for a board. And then I, this is the, uh, I'm a mother of two. Uh, the, the, the Next please, the kids are already grown up, but uh, I've been working as a working mother as well. So that this is also something to do with the, uh, the gender gap issues. Thank you very much. So this is the background. And so what women, how uh, we are working uh, in Japan, and then I don't know how much information you have, so that I'm going to kind of review the basic information. So in Japan, the Equal Opportunity Law has started in 1986. Since that time that it is prohibited for the, the, for the companies to divide men's work and women's work. Um, then we have a variety of great laws and regulations, maternity leaves, compensation during maternity leaves is very high. Next, please. And then child care leave in Japan is very good that we do have about one year to three years of the, uh, the uh, mainly paid uh, the child care leave by the government. Yes, next, please. And then during the childcare leave, that the other uh, two thirds are uh, the the base salary is paid, and so that about eighty percent of the salary is actually paid by the labor insurance. It's a, the great highly high coverage. So this is sixty seven percent plus tax. So this is a very good system, but uh, is it really good? Uh, there the issue later on, maybe during the panel discussions as well, that the, uh, the those regulations are really good or sounds very nice. And I, I often talk to the in, in the international conferences that the Japanese gentlemen, male men, are very, very kind so that they created so many great regulations for women but actually created the second road, like a mother truck, to next to the main truck or main promoting truck. So that that is why that we are still having a very, very big gender gap. Next page, please. But yeah, the, because of those other uh, regulations, that the dual income households increase very rapidly. Um, so about the uh, 1994 five, in the middle of this chart, that the orange line is the uh, double income household. So in Japan, that more women um, work than before. And next page, please. And then actually the female employment rate from age 15 to 64 is 63.6, .6, which is the more than US. So the in percentage wise that the Japanese women are working. Yes, the next page, please. 
And also that the Prime Minister Abe at the time uh, announced that the women should shine. And then um, the, the, there is the Act on Promotion of Women's Participation and Advancement in the Workplace. This act was started in 2016 and he, as a Prime Minister at the time, announced or declared that 2020, um, by 2020, then 30 percent of the management uh, level should be women. It was called 2020-30, but without any strong declaration that the government actually withdraw the announcement, so it didn't really happen. But he said so at the time. That is very important. The prime minister said so. Yes, next page, please. And so the issue is that the Japan for last 35, 40 years, that the other, there are so many regulations and acts and then great uh, system for uh, child care and so forth. But the realistic, um, the, the real situation is after 35 years later, that the gender gap ranking by WEF is still 120th out of 156 countries. The important thing is this is a gap. So the, the, the level of the wage or education may be higher than the other countries. However, that the gap between male and female in Japan is very, very big. Next, please. And then uh, the Japan stays low. Well, this the uh, the meaning that the uh, this gender gap the score uh, it has been really low among uh, G7 countries. So Japan is considered as a very uh, powerful economic country. However, that the gender gap stays low for years, almost 15, 20 years. We are very, very low. Yes. So nothing has changed, I would say. Okay, next, please. But then do Japanese, are Japanese women, um, I mean, uh, the, the, are, are we enabled to work? I mean, are we uneducated? No, that uh, OECD tested uh, the, the OECD countries, then adult skill, then they said, is the ability to um, the work in the society. Japan is actually ranking number one in the world. So meaning that the Jap Japanese people, male and female, has the highest education and ability to work. So the issue is not only the human rights issue, but the economic issue that the, 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 there are high ability women living and working in Japan, more women than US or working in Japan, but still there is a big, big gap between male and female. That is the, the issue. Yes, next page, please. So the, the issues in Japan, uh, 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 so many issues in Japan, uh, we, that the other in business, why there are the gender gaps. Um, the, the one is that the one time hiring, it means that after graduation of university, that the, uh, the university students start working the next day. Uh, there are not many students, not, not many students have the opportunity to, uh, could you turn off the microphone somebody? That the, uh, the um, not many Japanese university students have a choice to uh, work when. So right after the graduation, of the, uh, the university the next day that they have to start working. And then that is a kind of like a one shot thing so that um, their companies, the next is like a seniority system. The company hire male, mainly male, uh, some women, then they like a like a school, they have a class of 2000, class of 2020, 2022. So that everybody in the same year, the enter, enter, entry, they have a class and then every year they raise little by little. 
even though you are better than the other or you work harder than the other. So it's one shot hiring and seniority system is really um, damaging, uh, disturbing to uh, the closing the gender gap. The, 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 the third productivity evaluation and promotion system are the same, that the HR is so strong, so they have a right to order one person to switch to the other department or um, However, they do not have much power to um, their raise the, the the wages and so forth. So because because employees are ranked in the years, how many years they work for the company, and then the five general workers that we in Japan that because of the re, the law that it's very difficult to fire um, their employees. So once you hire then usually the person stays for ever unless that person get arrested or the person would like to leave so it's very difficult to um the um evaluate and then um the um yeah for the evaluations and then six is temp temporary workers that there are so many temporary workers recently because that because of this regulation of not able to fire people so that companies are afraid of hire um, there are many people as a regular workers so that the day would like to decrease the number of the regular workers which is full-time workers or even part-time workers then they would like to hire temporary workers which is uh, who are much cheaper in the way, and then uh, the fixed term, so that they could uh, the uh, the end the hiring at the end of the term they promised. And in society, the, the single mother issues and even poverty issues. That amazingly, even though the Japan is a, the very economically strong company countries, the one sixth of the children at elementary schools are under poverty. Um, and then uh, the, there are so many families uh, or kids are uh, unable to even eat. Um, and then the, the, we have a lot of NPOs and providing food and education for those uh, the families and the kids. And then the, lastly is culture that is still, well, Tokyo is the central city of Japan, so that the Tokyo is uh, maybe very, very special. But when you go to local uh, the cities, that the culture is still 20, 30 years ago, uh, back from the Western countries, I would say, that the, um, the, the, the men um, are, uh, well, women quit to work when they get married or first child. And th that happened in Tokyo many, many years ago. Not recently, but still that the whole Japan uh, has to move, that the culture is still very uh, the, uh, the key to the, uh, the gender gap. Well, the next page, please. So the the other the one of the the things also because of the one shot entry to the companies and then um and the seniority system that the companies when they hire people the they don't give trainings and also that the adults are not really learning. Um, so this is the OECD. Uh, the report from last year that the Japan is the lowest among OECD company countries for the educational and training, formal education and training after graduation of university in, in, in society. This is amazing, but the other, that uh, the once you get graduated from university, then uh, people stop studying or getting uh, very difficult to get trained. Next page, please. So, uh, there, because this is the other uh, uh, about five, ten minute, more minutes to go, so that I just would like to um, there, uh, throw questions to you all to think how do we um, the climb up the mountains of this gender gap issues? The, I've been attending or participating so many conferences for like 30 years regarding these issues. And then uh, the surface level that the, uh, the every country have the very similar symptoms, which is the gender gap uh, and equality. Um, there are a lot of things. However, that the how to climb up the mountain, the, the how to solve this 
problem. Awesome. Very varied according to the countries because of the cultures, regulations, and then customs are so much different. So what we have to do is we have to think of what would be the common ideas and then with them to share. Um, next, please. So what I have been doing to uh, the close the gender gap is one is provide network for women. And second is open roles and shows choices for women. Um, the thir third is raise awareness to political leaders and the fourth, raise awareness to the male business leaders. The, those are the really important things that what I could do from one individual to solve this uh, the problem. Uh, the, the one, uh, could you turn the page, please? The provide network for women and open roads shows choices to women are very important. Uh, today, I understand that the audience uh, participants of this uh, seminar is mainly political um, uh, or um, policymakers and so forth. Um, but for the regular women in Japan and also all the world in, in the world, that the, the not only women, but the, we have a tendency of getting to know, I mean, being friends with the similar people, and then. It's very small community, and even though there's so much information in the internet on the internet, we only access to what we want to access. So, so uh, the the most important thing is to provide the positive network, and then um, share positive thinking, and then show variety of choices that they she can make. Um, there, that's something that I've been doing because when I started my first business 36 years ago, um, there 36 years ago in Japan, there's no female entrepreneurs. There's no terminology of entrepreneurs. They call me woman president. And then um, the, the journalist came to me and asked me why I start my first the business, even though I was 20, I was 20s and single and no money and why I started business. And then what do I think of the gender gap in Japan, which I didn't know. I was too immature. And then, but I just started my first business. I just started doing and working and working, working, but I didn't know. So I started the very first network and first website for other women and me to learn each other and then uh, they keep going. And that was very, very powerful now that the, it became the largest diversity conference in Japan and the largest network of working women in Japan. Uh, when you see and meet people, positive um, the attitude or variety of choices, um, that open up your roles, right? So that the other, uh, I think, that this should be very international. Now, because it's online, I'm now speaking from Tokyo and you are listening in South Africa, um, yeah. online oh, or other. Yeah. So, so that the, the network, net, I, I often explain the network is not just a network, it's a net that works. So that the, um, the, when you we get connected, support each other, not just support each other, to uh, but to to really move forward is so important. That's something that we have to keep doing that. And next page, please. And then raise awareness to political leaders. Uh, there, because I was uh, selected as a council member to the government for last 15, 20 years, uh, I was in so many uh, the, the councils and various ministers and then uh, other associations or foundations. So, and then I uh, had the opportunity to meet many politicians, including prime ministers. So I thought that it's really important for those, especially male, very powerful, high positions, political leaders to know and experience what's going on among women and from the women's point of view. So uh, I've been talking to them and giving them informations 
and then suggesting and also invite them to come to our conference, not because I know them, but because that I would like them to get educated. I'd like them to get experience uh, what's going on. And then recently, what I am really working on is quota system uh, the and, and also procurement for women-owned business. Those two are the main issue that I've been talking to the government, local government of Tokyo and the and cabinet office and other uh, the main Japanese um, the government. That the quota system, it's a very controversial and I know that there's a pros and cons and that the various ideas. However, that in even uh, the, the European countries and including Japan, that 30, 40 years has passed, but nothing really happened naturally. Now this is a time that we have to take action for the political um, their action. The quota system is, I think, uh, they really needed uh, one for the board members. That the board members, well, because uh, the the way I chose the 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 way I rode uh, that ch chose to climb up mountain is from the business side. Um, so so quota system for the board members is very important because that oh I've been sitting on board for for the listed companies and then every month in Japan that, that there is a board meeting so that every month we meet and then I talk about diversity or I add ideas to the board meetings then in a year two years three years those CEOs and chairpersons and then other uh, uh, executives of those big, big, huge companies, they get educated and they get accustomed to listen by the women's voice and then a different point of view. And then when a leader of the big company change his mind, that is a big, that really influenced a lot. Uh, the, now that the Ukraine and Russia is in a very severe situation. And I saw that various American or global companies made a very quick decisions. And those decisions are made by one leader of a company. So the, the company's decision is very quick than sometimes than political decisions. So I think the quota system for board members and then top 10% of management is very important. Um, the procurement for the women-owned business is also very important. It's now uh, easier for men and women to start business, uh, e even in Japan. That is very easy so that, that there are so many female entrepreneurs. But somehow that the women's business are stay small. The, the, there are so many reasons and maybe two hours or three hours to discuss. However, that one, uh, the solution is like United States, that the, the U US has a government procurement goes, 5% goes to women-owned business. So uh, like that, the pro procurement for the women-owned business is a very powerful support, not only applause, giving applause, but to, to giving business to the women-owned business is very important. And then the, the third one is very unique to Japanese uh, the culture, the right to choose family name after marriage, that we are not allowed to choose um, their family name uh, their, from husband <coughs> to wife. So that the, uh, the, the, this is still the, uh, the big issue that the, the, if somebody has a, the question, I would like to answer later. The next page, please. Uh, to close, yes, uh, the the raise awareness to the main male business leaders. Again, I there are so many approaches to climb up this mountain, but I am choosing to um, the give great information to the business leaders so that they will make a very good decision, very very good decisions to change business and business styles and business culture. So I've been collecting a lot of data. And then and the, this is a very good example that the McKinsey has been uh, the studying that the, uh, the, gen, uh, the female, uh, the, the percentage, high, 
high percentage of female uh, in board or executive levels have more profitability than the others or more diversified company had the 36 percent more profit than the average. So these are the data that we have to collect and start telling to the people and also diversity index I created. This is not only a ranking by the public information, but this is for the real test. Um, the not only the uh, the survey, but the test included. Next page, please. That the other. Uh, I started to wondering that why. Well, it's great to de uh, the publicize the data of the company. Uh, of their, the ratio of women or ratio of disabled or nationalities. But sometimes the number is only number and that doesn't really show the diversity of non organizations or decision making process. So diversity index is created to do the corporate survey, individual survey and individual, individual test and analyze it to have a CEO dialogue so that not only just the surface or public data, but real inside of the company, what's going on. We have to measure it and then visualize it and then give the great feedback to the CEO so that the he or she could use the number or data to um, uh, make the company better. Thank you. And the next page, please. So e woman has been working to close up the close the gender gap uh, and then also the diversity leads innovation that is our mission statement uh, the today I would like to discuss with you all to um, their how we can work together uh, to close up close the gender gap the next page please so just let's work together and then um, there, I really am um, honored to speak today. And then um, there are so many similar issues of, between South Africa and Japan, and also very big uh, the difference in background to the symptom. So we could hopefully we could uh, have a very good discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Sasaki, for a very comprehensive and um, incisive um, analysis, giving us um, insight into the, the context in Japan. Uh, some of the key takeaways from, from what you've said is that culture is, is key to closing the gender gap. It's also an obstacle sometimes to closing the gender gap. Um, but you've outlined for us some of the ways that there can be collaboration across sectors um, and and also globally. Uh, for example, you've talked about um, uh, being providing a network um, for women, um, raising awareness to political leaders, and it's not only within a national context, but also um, an international context. So um, international governance arenas are also quite quite important, multilateral uh, fora. And then socialization, um, uh, as, as you've indicated, sometimes um, uh, an, an idea that is put to business male business leaders is new, but after some time, after they 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 become uh, uh, informed about the benefits of of that new idea, like a quota system, um, they become more um, receptive to it. So um, thank you so much, also for um, putting the details of e women of your your um, your company um, for us up, uh, and um, I'm sure that. Um, participants afterwards will um, uh, go and look at um, the work that you do and uh, uh, also to participants you can um, contact um, uh, uh, Ms. Sasaki um, and, and um, the activities of eWomen um, through the, the website of, 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 of eWomen. Um, there are a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, would you would you be willing to, to respond to, to those questions? So, so the sure. questions OK, so so the, the questions are, are um, related uh, to some extent. The one question is about um, this is a, a South African film star, Charlie Strun. Um, she is based in Hollywood and, 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 and got a lot of success in, in Hollywood. And she recently said, says the person who asks the question that actually COVID did not um, impact women um, uh, uh, that badly those who are in the film industry. So the, the question is um, whether um, the information and communications technology sector is maybe more gender neutral, um, so that, for example, the, the negative impacts of COVID um, 
you know, didn't uh, play out so severely. So I, I will make that a more broader question, which is about whether certain economic sectors um, uh, or business environments are more receptive towards um, a gender um, equity or, or putting in measures for, for gender equity. And then there's the, the, the related question which um, a, a person asks and um, the, 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 the person from the audience says that you've, you've spoken a lot about the business um, context, um, but whether um, uh, the social context and the business context are not interlinked. And so whether the gender gap, what, what does that mean in terms of closing the gender gap um, in both the business and social um, uh, uh, contexts? Okay, if I understand correctly. So that the first question is like, is there any industries um, not really affected by COVID? Uh, so, so well, I, am under, I understand that COVID really affect a lot of business and then uh, and especially women or temporary workers or, you know. Uh, however, I really think that online kind of like this kind of seminars or workshops or connections and network, this online technology has really developed in last two years. And then now we could talk internationally, globally, so that the business related to uh, or using IT has more opportunity than before. So that the um, the that that doesn't really mean that the IT business, even if you were just teaching to kids, uh, you know, in person, then that you're um, now can teach online. Uh, even like our conference, that the International Conference of Women Business, it was we, we have been doing in Tokyo. It's international, but we got together. One thousand people got together in Tokyo for last twenty five years. Now it's online, and I decided to keep it online forever. That that it because that then we could have more people more corporations to be a partner and the more speakers from all over the world we have the speaker from new york san francisco uh netherlands england kenya's and you know students from all over the world. so so that the other what we could do is that the other using this online technology uh the i think that our business or our whatever discussion even business or uh, social uh, could be more powerful, and 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 uh, in that sense, that the women has, I guess, that more um, in general uh, have a better skills in networking and sharing. So that um, maybe we could have more opportunities, and because we do not need to think of our market or choices are close to local. Now it's like borderless. And then what was the second question? Second question is like business, the, the, the what we should do to business and in social. Yes. So, so that, uh, well, the, the, uh, again, like, I guess uh, what, what I have been concentrated on is like accumulating data, collecting data, the figures, uh, tangible data or result so that we could persuade men. Like uh, when I saw, well, for, but, let me just start talking a bit about business side. But when I visited United States um, in about early 1990s, uh, the, right after I started my first business, they had the struggle. They struggle that the female entrepreneurs in the United States were struggle at the time. However, they had a big announcement that by twin by year 2000, more than half of their SMEs has got going to be woman owned. That powerful message were delivered from this female speaker, that male speaker, that association, that conference, all the time that around the early 1990s, that wherever I go, I heard that by two year 2000, that American business, the half of the small business is going to be owned by women. Then that made all the uh, to move that the the banks that the banks were very hesitant to invest or give money or loan uh, money for the business uh, women female business leaders. However, that if their customers more than half of their customers were turned to be female, it's just like or dislike. 
It's just their business. So that the day started to, to open up the door for female entrepreneurs or business leaders to, okay, come to our bank. We are supporting. We help you business plan. We help you success. So, <clears throat> and we give you money so that, you know, uh, please work together. And that was a very, very easy shift. Shift. So when I saw that, I thought, hmm, this is the key to really open up for male people who are sitting in the the high positions, close up the door and they lock the door from inside, and they don't want women or others to go into their luxury, you know, uh, the houses. I mean, how do we persuade them to open the door? It, 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 I would like them to feel like they would like to open doors. So we have to give them good data information. So diversity uh, leads innovation. Uh, the, the, the diversity could make you more profitable or you know, people would respect you more with this attitude. I mean, whatever the thing is, we have to approach with them to the business leaders. But the same to the political leaders. Political leaders would like to change countries or uh, the cities better, right? So that the other, uh, we have to give them data. And then in that sense, that the international pressure is very strong, that uh, all the political leaders are uh, working together internationally in a way, so that the, we should share a good data from other countries and then use that as a very positive foreign pressure. Especially Japanese politi politicians are very weak to the foreign pressure. So that I've been, whenever that I have opportunities to speak in an international conference, I'd like those participants, non-Japanese participants, to um, their, I ask them to keep saying to the Japanese people that to open the door so that the other, the, that pressure could be worked positively. If I make sense, then that that makes and, makes perfect sense. And then uh, there, because that I introduced at the conference, at the International Conference for Women Business, that I am going to produce this year, July tenth. Uh, the it's a simultaneous interpretation for ten hours, nonstop, no break, more than fifty speakers, and then uh, we have a, a, a participant from uh, African countries or European countries and U.S. So please join us on July tenth. Yeah, and we can have a network opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Saki, for such an energetic and powerful um, uh, presentation and also for opening um, up um, uh, doors uh, for, for us um, from various parts of the world listening to, to the work that, that you are doing. So um, uh, we now move to a panel discussion. And um, uh, in the panel discussion, I'm sure that the, the panelists will also be addressing uh, the, the questions um, that, that you put to us um, to, to reflect about and um, also um, will um, add additional um, insights from, from their own um, contexts. So for the panel discussion, we, um, we have again a formidable lineup of, of speakers. Um, uh, we uh, have uh, Professor Tuli Marunsela. Uh, I've been informed that uh, Professor Marunsela is, is online. Um, Professor Marunsela has, like Ms. Sasaki, um, an, 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 an extensive um, curriculum um, uh, vitae, so um, maybe it takes a lot of time to, to go through the, the entire um, uh, CV. But just to highlight a few points about uh, Professor Marunsela's um, work, and, and her current um, position. Professor Badunsela is um, an advocate of the High Court of South Africa and is the Law Trust Chair in Social Justice and a law professor at the University of um, Stellenbosch, where she conducts and coordinates social justice research and teaches constitutional and administrative law. Most of us would know Professor Badunsela best as um, the former public protector of South Africa from 2009 to 2016, um, which she uh, really uh, did a lot uh, uh, in her time there to transform um, the institution to make it more um, uh, transparent and also more um, uh, accountable. There are many uh, international accolades that Professor Marancela have has received, um, including recently being appointed as Knight 
uh, of the Legion of Honor by French President Emmanuel Macron in recognition of Professor Marunsela's fight against corruption in South Africa and uh, in for her work in the defense um, in defense of the rule of law. But I think lastly, it's, it's probably worth mentioning um, that she also has a rose named after her um, in recognition of um, uh, the, the social justice and integrity work that um, she is uh, doing. So I hand over now to Professor Marunsela. Professor Marunsela, you can, um, uh, sh uh, your camera is still um, closed. So if, if you can um, uh, show your camera. Hello. Yes, Professor, can you, can you, um, so we, 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 are you able to show your camera? I am not. Can I okay. speak without it? Of course, of course. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you for the privilege of addressing this august occasion. As a mountain climber who has summited Kilimanjaro twice to close the gender gap on menstrual health, I have come to realize that advancing social justice, including closing the gender gap and restituting centuries of injustice is like climbing mountains. With every summit comes the realization that there are many more peaks that wait to be scaled. When as the Department of Justice, we hosted the first women's judges conference in this country with a handful of women judges about two decades ago. We drew inspiration from a poster in our conference center, which was the Cape Town International Convention Center. In that poster was the following quote. I have walked the long walk to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way, but I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come, but I can only rest for a moment. For with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger for long, for my long walk is not ended. By now you already know that that quote is from President Nelson Mandela. There is no doubt in my mind that since South Africa embraced a new constitution that is a blueprint for establishing a new society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, where everyone's potential is freed and every citizen's life is improved. There has been great progress on all fronts of social justice, including gender justice. And this comes from not only implementing the constitution, it also comes from South Africa embracing various international obligations, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. But I would like to to think that both here in South Africa and elsewhere in the world, the greatest game changer on gender equality was the Beijing Platform for Action. And I feel privileged that I was one of those that contributed to its drafting, although I could not go to the first Beijing conference, but attended all of the other ones 
except the most recent one of equality is same treatment. I know there are still people, probably some in this room, that still think equality is treating people the same and equity is uh, when you treat people with substantive justice. But the game changer that was the Beijing platform for action departed from equality as same treatment to understanding that equality includes embracing diversity, includes restituting legacy in justice. And the instrument that the Beijing Platform for Action introduced for this purpose was gender mainstreaming. So where are we today in terms of the gender gaps given the fact that not only do we have one of the most celebrated constitutions in the world and, and that we have embraced all of the international instruments that seek to advance gender equality and to reset the agenda when it comes to embracing the human rights of both men and women by making sure that advancing human rights is not about treating people the same. It is about embracing difference, addressing accumulated disadvantages when it comes to men and gender unassigned people. And it is also about restituting past injustices. In South Africa, I can say without fear of contradiction that we've done exceptionally well in politics. We are one of the first few countries not to have a constitutional quota on women, but to have political will expressed in the white paper on the public service and expressed in party political instruments to embrace what is called the zebra approach, which is 50-50. And it made sure that since the dawn of democracy, women have been adequately represented in parliament and the number has been increasing to the point that we are approaching 50%. And not only were women represented in parliament, South Africa is one of those countries where women have been given traditionally male portfolios that are regarded as very difficult. And I remember very early in democracy, communications, including digital communication, was given to Ivy Matsipe Kasaburu. The military has on several occasions been given to women, such as uh, the fact that right now the, military, the Minister of Defense is a woman. The Minister of Communications is a woman. The Minister of Health has for several years been uh, a woman. And of course, right now we do have women. And at some stage, we even had a deputy president who was a woman. The president of the second highest court in South Africa, which is the Supreme Court of Appeal, is a woman. And not just a woman, if you look at the intersection of race and gender domination, she is a black woman. The Constitutional Court has, from the very same first day when it was established, had women. Of course, the number was worrying, but over the years, the number has been increasing. We started with only two, and, and, and now we have four women represented in the Constitutional Court. And, of, and there's growing consciousness to make sure that this gap is closed. When I think about that poster that Joyce Malulege and I admired and we included in the report on the Women's Ju Judges Conference, and she included it in her speech as well, you can really see that many mountains have been climbed, but a lot more need to be climbed. And one of the areas is what our colleagues our colleague from Japan has drawn to our attention, which is women's involvement in entrepreneurship and in the economy. In South Africa, women have always been involved in entrepreneurs. Even black women during the darkest days of apartheid were able to send children to school. I'm, I'm an example of those children sent to school because when men could not step up for whatever reason, sometimes not their fault, um, like the mining industry not paying people sufficiently and um, uh, humans being treated as disposable and occasionally being retrenched. Women stepped in through entrepreneurship, selling this and that and making a difference. My mom was an entrepreneur, one of the early ones who 
uh, started selling sweets, fruits, etc., in schools, which is now tuck shops and uh, and on the side of the road, which she led because when my father was um, unjustly retrenched uh, after being sick, my father joined my mom in entrepreneurship, and they became pioneers in creating what today we re- refer to as the spaza shops in the township. And my father was also a pioneer in the taxi industry. So there's no question that women have always been involved in business in this country. The question is, has business recognized women's involvement as business? We talk, for example, about creating jobs. The thinking is creating jobs will involve government creating jobs, some of which are artificial, just to make sure that we get as many people in, or we expand business. I mean, if you look at what the broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act did, it mostly expanded the frontiers of capital for big business. And then to the extent that they could include um, historically excluded people initially, it was agreed that it should be 50% today. They just have to do 30%. But instead of taking those resources and meeting women where they are, but with a GBV, initiative that was started by women and embraced by the president. I am aware, though, that there is intention to open up space. 50% of government tenders or government contracts are to be opened up to women businesses directly. For me, that addresses the injustices of the past and the injustices that have been created by BEE, because BEE sought to include people indirectly. Okay, you will be a supplier to a business that will get the tender provided. It it, it involves you as a supplier and it has a handful of black people and, and black women as, a, as shareholders in that business. And I do, I do think that came from a good place, but it wasn't a good strategy. And I think we're moving into territory where we're going to do much better. Education is one area where women in South Africa have moved, the needle has moved significantly in education. We now uh, have women in the SET sectors, uh, science, um, um, uh, technology, and engineering. We have women in medical science, and I've spoken to you about women judges. I, I could also give you data, which I will share later, on numbers in the, the legal field and, and many other fields. But although we have scaled some mountains here, the gaps are really, really, really worrying. We haven't done as much as we could have done and should have done. Partly, again, for me, it is not embracing gender mainstreaming adequately or social justice mainstreaming, as we say, at Stellenbosch University. And a great example is COVID-19. Women in South Africa were the hardest hit by the COVID-19 situation because of their pre-existing social and economic vulnerabilities in areas such as these seven areas. Political clout, being left behind in the digital space, being left behind when it comes to control over the economy, particularly the mainstream economy, which did better during COVID-19 education inequalities, spatial disparities, including the rural and urban divide and the infrastructure gaps that go with um, the rural urban divide and the township and suburbs divide. Six, GBV and mental health has hit women far more than it has hit men. And of course, we're waking up now that we're seeing suicide impacting on men, but women have been battling, carrying their own pain and the pain of families and organizations with them. The seventh area where uh, there's a serious gap is culture and related attitudes. Attitudes. Much as the law says men and women are equal, much as the law embraces substantive equality, we've not done enough in moving men and boys into the space of gender equality. And as a result, we start with toxic masculinities that are harmful to both women and men, but that still prevents therefore women being fully embraced as equals in business, in the workplace, in education, and in relationships. And lastly, men 
have not stepped up to plug the game, the gap in the home as women take most spaces in the workplace, in politics, and in society. Because if men are not stepping up in the family, then that means women are continuing to do a double shift, working in the workspace and in politics and other places, and still coming back. And we saw this happening during COVID-19, where women had to step in as teachers in the family, as the ones who cook because domestic workers couldn't come in because of the lockdown. So the gap that had been plugged by teachers and domestic workers was opened, wide open during COVID-19. And it became clear that as women become more engaged in society, including the workplace and the business space, Men need to be more engaged in the family in terms of looking after children, helping with homework, cooking, and just generally being present. Mm -hmm. So what have we done wrong to lead to this? I would say that the, the, the key gap, as we see it at Stellenbosch University, has been on two areas. One is the lack of impact conscious policy planning and law reforms. So when laws are created, they're mostly about one size fits all. And we saw this again in the design of COVID-19 regulations and the design of assistance packages. Both presumed that everyone is situated in the same way and everyone would be affected in the same way. And we warned in April 2020 already as um, a, a, a social justice monitoring group on COVID-19, but a one-size-fits-all approach is going to exacerbate the situation of those who are already left behind. And key among those who are left behind are women and women who exist at the axis of inter intersectional oppressions and, and domination. So that has happened. The second thing that we see is lack of conscious implementation of constitutional governance and compliance with international obligations. And I know, having worked in government, that when it comes to reporting on seed or Beijing platform for action, etc., it's always about finding things that match, as opposed to looking at a conscious implementation program and saying, of what we're implementing consciously, uh, what did we achieve? But I want to say that things are changing. I remember the Department of Health when it came to implementation of the Millennium Development Goals. There was a very conscious uh, implementation of those goals around maternal mortality and child mortality. And those conscious goals were in every health facility. Everyone knew, just like the... Uh, the, the worker, the general worker at NASA many years ago knew that he was contributing to getting the first person on the moon. In the Department of Health, everyone, including the cleaner, knew that they were contributing to South Africa's attainment of the Millennium Development Goals. I don't know what's the situation now when it comes to the SDGs. And I hope the Department of Health is doing the same. This we found out when we did a survey on how South Africa was implementing the Millennium Development Goals. But now at the Social Justice Chair, we found that that consciousness that at the Department of Health accompanied the implementation of the Millennium Development Goals is not a consciousness that is accompanying the implementation of the SDGs, but it can be done. We've seen it being done. We've seen gender mainstreaming change the way we draft laws. I know in the Department of Justice, it's one of those that really did gender mainstreaming. And I know that because I was part of firstly doing a needs assessment on all aspects of gender mainstreaming and designing an instrument for that had a 12 dimensions look of, of gender mainstreaming and, and making sure that it was used to assess the gap and it was used to plug the gap. Uh, as we speak now, is the challenge of GPV. The challenge of GPV is not a policing challenge only. And part of our mistake is to make it a policing challenge. The challenge of G GPV is a systems problem. 
It has to do with attitude, a culture of um, men being debased and them debasing women. It's a, it is also women being mm. unequal when it comes to economic uh, inclusion. It is an infrastructure problem. It is a mental health problem. And if we address all of these collectively, we can make a difference. But just in conclusion, I just want to say we can, we have done, we have achieved a lot. We have summited a lot of mountains so when it comes to plugging the gender gap. Um, the question is, how do we move forward? Can it be done? Politics have shown us that it can be done. Women's representation in South Africa in politics has done two things. One is we've increased the numbers of women's representation, but by increasing the number of women being represented and creating a critical mass, we have shifted the neural pathways that think that competence is a male issue, it's not a human issue. And Plato had said that, actually, when you do elections first past the post, what will happen is people would elect the aristocrats because they're used to seeing the aristocrats wielding power. So when it comes to gender, we were used to seeing men wielding power. Proportional representation, the zebra approach, made sure that there were enough women for people to to get accustomed to seeing women wielding authority. And as a result, now women are often elected in their own right, not as part of PR, it, as, as would members, they get elected. So this, we can learn from this and, 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 and move it into other spaces in life. Evidence revealed by McKenzie and others shows that companies that fully include women in decision-making do well by leveraging gender diverse thinking and innovation. And my colleague has already addressed that matter admirably. Thirdly, evidence suggests that women leaders have handled the COVID-19 situation exceptionally by not confining the issues to the binary issue of health and the economy, which is danger and money. Women leaders have understood that society is not about just preventing danger and money or in, in getting money. They've understood that societies are also about social well-being. And that's what you see in New Zealand and, and in several European countries that are led by women. So by women moving societies forward, it, it will make societies begin to respect women leaders, to trust women leaders, and, and break the culture of not trusting women and not believing in women's leadership. In some sectors, including the judiciary, the gender gap is closing. Um, however, um, what is also emerging, I, 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 I spoke to you about the gender quota that has been introduced as part of GPV. So that's one of the things that are being done and that shows that things can be done. At Stellenbosch University, we're using the philosophy that was underpinning gender mainstreaming to have social justice mainstreaming, to design instruments to help government, business, and others to always think about what will be the impact on different groups in society when you're planning this law, this policy, or this program. And, and, and make sure that if the impact is going to be adverse in one group, you either redesign the policy or alternatively, you have your compensation strategy exactly the same time you implement the policy. And we think that if the policy brief we gave to government in April 2020 was adhered to, COVID-19 would have been handled differently. But again, I'm not suggesting that government, uh, there was no political will. Our government was responding to an emergency with the information government already has, with the skills it has, with the values it has. And ours is to contribute to that change of skills, values, and information. Because we don't think there's mm -hmm. lack of political will. We don't think there's lack of resources. What is needed is purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and systems-thinking-based government processes. In civil society and the business community, we need solutionist leadership and engaged citizenship, where there's greater collaboration in leveraging the transformative power 
of social accountability and active citizenship beyond complaining. So we can do this, dear colleagues, and I do think in ending, let's use the SDG and COVID-19 reset opportunities as a perfect storm that makes a case for catalyzing progress in closing the gender gap but secondly, it gives us an opportunity as part of the rebuilding process, rebuilding better process, to include gender mainstreaming and social justice mainstreaming in our process. We have summited a lot of mountains in advancing gender equality and closing the gender gap here in South Africa and globally. But we may have lingered a little longer than we should have. With increased speed, deliberate constitutional governance and compliance with international shared values, we can make immense progress in advancing gender equality and plugging the gender gap, particularly during the SDG timeline, whose summit is 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Marinsela. Thank you for such a rich um, discussion and uh, linking so well with um, what uh, Mr. Saki has been um, uh, challenging us with in terms of what 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 should be done, what um, uh, progress has been made, but at the same time, what the remaining um, obstacles are. So I'm very happy that even though um, uh, I think this is this comes across from both your discussions that the contexts are different in Japan and um, uh, South Africa, but the issues are the same in terms of lack of economic um, inclusion, obstacles to to, to inclusion for for women, um, and then of course the way in which um, factors such as space, infrastructure, politics, and all of those things actually collude um, to make um, women's um, situation worse. Um, uh, uh, and and the burdens for women um, uh, more um, more burdensome. So I'm conscious of it, and and so thank you so much also for for um, having also the technical challenges this morning, but still um, joining us uh, today. So very very grateful for you for your time. Uh, there's there was a, it's a rich discussion, and there were questions about um, uh, whether there is a recording that will be made available. And yes, that that will be subject to, of course, the consent of our speakers today. So let me hand over to our next panelist, and that is also um, a, an extremely impressive, um, powerful um, person in in business as well as in um, in in other social domains. It is Dr. Futium Toba. Dr. Mtoba is the founder, currently um, uh, the founder of, of Teach um, South Africa, which you will be talking uh, uh, about uh, this morning, and um, chair of the council at the University of um, Pretoria. And she is a former chair and partner of the board of Deloitte Southern Africa. Dr. Mtoba holds uh, degrees um, in accounting, uh, including um, a, a doctorate, an honorary doctorate. Um, she is a 2017 Harvard University Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellow and currently serves as the Chair of Council, as indicated um, at the University of Pretoria, um, as Chair of the WOB Trust and as Non-Executive Director of South 32 um, Limited Discovery Holdings and Discovery Bank. So uh, thank you so much for your patience this morning, um, Dr. Mtoba, and we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Connelson, uh, for your introduction and um, uh, to the University of Stellenbosch for inviting me to participate on this um, webinar. I just need to correct the CV because it, it is a criminal case to falsify a CV. So I am the past chair of the University of, of, of Pretoria and also chair of past chair of WDB. So Professor Madonzela will attest. So if you think about me, then um, what the Harvard, when we attended the Harvard Initiative, they called us previously important people. So they referred us to PIPs. So I, I regard myself as a PIP. <laughs> uh, thank you. 
a warm greetings to my uh, fellow esteemed panelists and to, to all the, the participants. And also a very special greetings to His Excellency, Mr. Noire Maruyama, the ambassador of Japan to South Africa. Your, your Excellency, Teach South Africa, which I, I co-founded, has enjoyed a support of your embassy through, amongst others, the participation on the JET uh, program. So I will take this opportunity to say, Domo Arigato Gozaimas. The McKinsey Global Institute estimated um, in 2015 that if we were to participate, if women were to participate in the economy identical to men, they would add up 28 trillion US dollars or 26% to the annual global GDP in 2025, which is about uh, three years from now. So th this is also roughly estimated um, to be the combined sizes of the US and China economy today. So just as uh, Ms. Sa Sasaki's point was raised, the economic case is well made. And now I will come back to what needs to be done. So COVID-19 um, affected all of us, but bias um, against women is still compromising only women. So issues of, issues of women and in women in business deserve this special attention. So in this regard, I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar because this conversation is crucial if we are serious about addressing poverty, unemployment, and inequality in this country and in our continent of Africa. So in my contribution, I'll cover five, um, uh, five areas, which is the um, issues that face um, business women as we speak. Secondly, the climate faced by women in business, talking to the art of balancing the risk and reward and of starting up and running a business. And thirdly, um, the elephant in the room, which uh, Professor Madonsela has also spoke to, which is the law. I will also then touch on the project that I am currently engaged with, which I believe, uh, Professor Madonsela, it will be the third um, game changer, adding to the list of two that you spoke to. And I will conclude. So firstly, the issues that face women as we speak, when I refer to women or women in, I will be referring to, when I refer to women, I'm really talking about women, uh, business women. And also when I talk about business, I'm referring to employment and entrepreneurship. So it is very important that we recognize that there is nothing new in what holds women's back. And it's, it's also important to acknowledge this so that we do not reinvent the world. So our generation must build on the foundation, the work, the struggles, the lessons, and the mistakes of the women that came before us, the likes of um, Maya Charlotte McClague and also Madam C.J. Walker. So believing that we know it all and then we can solve it all without that intergenerational alignment um, would be a mistake. So secondly, the uh, climate that um, face women-led businesses talking to the art, the, the art of balancing risk and rewards of starting up and running a business one need to understand that that climate faced by women is really over and above the normal business risks and rewards of running a business. So it's, it's, it's significant to realize that women in this case are not asking for favors, 
but that the uniqueness faced by women must be taken into account. Because over and above the normal challenges facing anyone who starts a business venture, women face the added burden of patriarchy, misogyny, gender-based violence, structural and cultural impediments, historical imbalances, and the fight back from apologists. The women also carry the disproportionate share of child rearing and parenting, which puts them in a disadvantage when looking at how demanding business can be of anyone's time. So women have to overcome fight back from apologies of gender bias. By this, I mean constantly being asked questions like, Footy, I mean, you raise up, you have been the chair of Deloitte, but why do we still have to talk about women? Or we are empowering women, what about men? Suddenly, men are the victims. And yet, when you look at the statistics, such as the representation of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, we see only 5% representation of women. So you have to ask yourself, where are these men that are suddenly at the risk of extinction? And also when we talk about the pay gap, the ask is simply pay women the same salary as men for the same job. So without demanding exceptions for women in business, it is important to appreciate how these societal and cultural norms can hold back uh, women unless they are openly discussed, openly challenged, openly evaluated and aggressively changed in order to eliminate all these biases that um, militate against progression of women in business. Thirdly, the elephant in the room, which is the law. By law, I'll use it generically to mean policies, conventions, MOUs, those practices that bind people and how people do things. Some of them are customary. These are not laws written in statutes of parliament. They are just customs. For instance, the assumption, the patrilineal society we live in, Patrilineal is not written in law, but still affects how decisions are taken. Up to and including, dare I say, women refusing to appoint a woman successor of themselves. They are not written down, but are part of the environment in which we operate. So our response in order to address this challenge, we then have to identify all those legal systems that militate against the women, understand them and how they still is prejudicial to the interest of women. Also tackling some of those practices and have it, even when the law has changed to eradicate the risk. And then of course, importantly lobbying the um, decision makers across the public and the private sector to accelerate all the necessary reforms for transformation in our environment. Then I'll move into the next one, which is my uh, the work that I'm currently doing. If we look at the UN report, it tells us that three quarters of the 781 million of illiterate people age 15 and over are women. And this position remain unchanged for the past decade. Further, it also tells us that the vast majority of those women are in Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia. And I am glad that uh, Professor Madonzella mentioned that entrepreneurship has been um, with the way women have gone about. So therefore, 
it is a natural pathway to economic empowerment because what it does is it enables um, women to contribute to their household incomes, to contribute to economic growth. And whatever size the business a woman, um, uh, or the size of the business that the woman run, they are able to earn their own money. They have um, an improved self image, they are confident and they are able to become strong role model for their girl child and also for the community. So the Women Economic Assembly, the initiative um, which I am chairing is a multi-stakeholder platform that is calling for the acceleration of participating of women in the economy, particularly through the sector value chains. So that's the ensuring that procurement at all levels of the sector value chains includes women. So this is a, um, a, a deliberate and a very targeted um, strategy. Also recognizing that the, 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 the milestones need to be short term, medium term and long term. We recognize that address, we have to address this in a multifaceted approach, which includes integrating gender consideration in the company's uh, function. We've also designed a framework that looks at a number of areas, including capacity building of women, market access, um, market demand information, export and, and, and domestic um, uh, market information. So our aim is really to consciously shift private sector and government to constantly ask themselves, are you growing future business women leaders? Are we building capacity and preparing women to effectively contribute to a, a, a growing economy? So we're recognizing that women are the buyers, the customers, the decision makers, and also in the job market. And our economy is targeted to grow at 1%, which is already not enough or sufficient to address the poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Also, South Africa's recovery plan strategy calls for localization of our economy, which is critical for growth and development. So this means now every business should be asking themselves, how much of its input is procured locally from women-owned businesses. What's also important about this initiative is that it, um, the, the, it addresses the realization that there is a direct link between gender-based violence and the, and the economic status of women. And we all know how gender-based violence has uh, uh, bedeviled our country. Critically, um, our country always have comprehensive plan, but there are not enough measures of the results and the impact. So um, we are developing an, a comprehensive annual index to measure the progress advanced in those uh, supply chain by each different Econ uh, um, uh, sector of the economy. So this index will not only focus on the hard economic indicators, but on skills development, on technical capacity, building the support to the women, the mentorship, the incubation. So in the long run, we would like to see both the private sector and government procurement to be allocated, 50% of it to be allocated to to, to women. So in the interest of time, I will conclude by saying that despite all the objective and anecdotal evidence, e.g., uh, for an example, the fact that SNP global study about women-run companies show that they outperform male co uh, counterparts, which is an objective study, 
and also how New Zealand and Germany have outperformed countries run by men on the management of COVID, which is, you can call it anecdotal, but it happened. So we, we must still articulate and quantify the true value of participation of women. Hence, for us, the annual index, which we will call the Women Economic Assembly Empowerment Index, will be a vital tool to measure, report, factual women participating at a granular le in your level, at the level of the supply chain, and to show the growth in GDP resulting from the utilization of our human resources. So I'll cover the other areas in the, in the question and answer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Dr. Mtova, also again, a very comprehensive and, and very incisive um, uh, discussion. Dr. Mtova is a seasoned businesswoman, and it's very interesting how um, her um, uh, experience that she was relaying to us and, and the, the insights that, that she was, was giving us now, how, how those um, very much dovetail with um, what Ms. Sasaki has also been um, uh, advising us, for example, about having evidence-driven interventions, um, uh, um, developing, um, having sufficient data about women's participation in the economy. Um, uh, and from the developing indices and then um, uh, using those to, to try to change um, uh, the business sector, to change minds within um, the business um, sector. So uh, uh, there are, there has been a question, I think that was posted, we'll, we'll leave that um, for the, um, uh, the uh, towards the end for the, the Q&A session. Uh, we have um, our final panelist, and that is Professor Machiko Osawa. So Professor Osawa is a Professor Emeritus uh, of uh, Japan uh, Women's um, uh, University. Uh, and at the moment, she is a um, specially appointed researcher at the Research Institute for women and careers at Japan Women's uh, University. Like all of our panelists this morning and our, 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 our illustrious speakers, um, Professor Osawa served on um, a, a number of advisory boards um, for the Ministry of Education, uh, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology in Japan, as well as the Ministry of Health, uh, Welfare and Labor. And she has also given advice to the, the Prime Minister's um, office um, on um, gender issues. Um, so she has published uh, widely. I'll just um, uh, uh, name some of the, the titles um, of, of her books that uh, she has published uh, about um, uh, women and the economy in Japan. These are Economic Change um, and Women Workers, Japan, US Comparison, when Housewives Return to the Labour Market Towards Second Chance Society, and uh, uh, most recently, Why There Are So Few Women Managers in the Japanese um, Workplace, which was published a uh, few years ago in 2019. So, uh, Professor Osawa, thank you for your patience again, and we very much look forward to your um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you, and if you would like to share your um, I'd like to uh, share this. Uh, yes. Yeah, I would try and see. Uh, oops. Can you see? Sorry, that. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Nice. Yes, we see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, slideshow. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm a labor economist, and the. Uh, Okay, in the uh, so um, I want to talk uh, three different topics. Uh, one is the situation of women workers in Japan, and the secondly that why women's status is so low, which I think that everybody has talked about uh, uh, today. The uh, sort of the gender gap index of uh, Japan uh, remain to be. Uh, low. So I just want to give you some explanation uh, we give uh, and then also the impact of COVID-19 on women in Japan. 
So the situation of women workers in Japan, as I already mentioned that the gender gap index at 2021, uh, Japan is here. And uh, I think it's the uh, yours is, sorry about this, and yours that uh, uh, gender gap is the 18th um, uh, index in 2000. 21 uh the uh i think that's the uh, uh very high so i think that learning from the uh, previous speakers uh, yeah there are lots of uh, uh sort of positive policies uh, uh quota system is introduced and uh, procurement uh of uh, a women owned business, uh, um, you know, encouraged and, and all those sort of things. I think this is the result of uh, uh, the position of your country. And then the, um, uh, the gender wage gap uh, is also very low in Japan. This, uh, this is a figure in 2014. And now the 73 point, about the 70% of uh, uh, the wage gap is about 70%, which meaning that the uh, women earn 70% of what men earns. So that uh, uh, why this is the, uh, the huge wage gap, uh, the recent empirical study shows that the 70% uh, of gender wage gap is observed among uh, regular workers. And the uh, biggest reason for wage gap is the uh, uh, promotion. The uh, women are facing uh, lower probability of uh, women uh, in promotion. And uh, women are also concentrated in uh, lower echelon of professions. Uh, and uh, so there are strong sex segregation among um, professional occupation. And the, uh, so um, I was asked, uh, uh, many people just said, why women do not want to be managers? And the, uh, the primary reason is the opportunities are not given to women uh, so that the talented women uh, tend to lose perspective and they change the job. Uh, the other uh, reason is longer working hours uh, that made married women difficult to balance work and raising children. And uh, also that the uh, regular workers in Japan are obliged to accept the requirement of transfer of the, uh, uh, the distance to office and overtime. So um, the uh, this is the figure for uh, uh, situation of uh, Japanese workers uh, working long hours, that um, percentage of employees working more than 50 hours per week. Um, Korea and Japan is, this proportion is very high. So this is one of the obstacle um, that the Japanese uh, women uh, difficult to be the managers. Uh, so, uh, Professor Sao, this is uh, the chair. Uh, just uh, sorry, the, the slides aren't advancing on our side, so maybe you can click individually on each slide um, and maybe that will um, uh, show the content of what you are discussing, uh, if possible. But if, if it's not possible, then that's fine. You cannot see, you cannot see it. We see the slides, but it, but it's not advancing, so it's not showing next slide, next slide. All right, uh, I'm talking about characteristics of Japanese social system. Yes, is this what you are uh, watching right now? No, at the moment we we still see your um your 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 first slide, the title title page. Oh my goodness. Okay, what can I do? Uh, can I ask you to do it or? Uh, uh, you, you you can you can. Oh, yeah. You can continue your, your presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you'd like to, to click on each individual slide. But if that doesn't yeah. work, if that doesn't work, then that's fine. Yeah. Then you can just continue with, with your discussion. OK, uh, can you see this graph? No, no, we, we don't. But what, what we will do is we will um, 
with your uh, permission, uh, post the, 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 the PowerPoint uh, to the website, the webinar website afterwards. If yes, you... that, that would be the best. And okay. the, uh, uh, sorry, I thought the uh, trial run, everything works hard, but uh, seems to be it, this is not working. So I, I'll try to explain uh, yes. the short the, uh, slide I am uh, uh, showing is that the uh, there are two uh, uh, scale of wage uh, with the age distribution and one is the uh, uh, full-time workers. Full-time workers, the wage grow with age, but the uh, part-time workers hasn't grown. So that the many of the uh, part-time workers are married women. So the uh, even though the beginning of the age, young age, the wage is the same. When you uh, progress, uh, you know, age, there's a huge gap. So uh, th this is the uh, uh, one of the problem. And then the uh, okay, I would just the other issue. I am. Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, taxation system, and the uh, about the uh, uh, ten million n, uh, which is hundred thousand, what thousand dollars is hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, the uh, household, the uh, there's an incentive for women to re re restrain her earnings within. Uh, Hundred thousand yen a year because then the uh, your taxable income is reduced, and then the uh, one point three million yen uh, you don't uh, uh, up to the your income is up to one point three million yen you don't have to pay a social security so in a way the women are. Uh, tend to choose part-time jobs because that reduces the tax of, uh, tax obligation. And uh, so those are the system still remain to be uh, exist in Japan. So uh, those are the uh, two things that the wage system that uh, if you choose part-time, that uh, your income is low and then the uh, Taxation system also gives you incentive uh, not to work certain hours. So uh, um, if you increase minimum wage, for instance, probably that the women tend to reduce working hours so that even though the shortage of the uh, labor uh, uh, you know, force, that the uh, income, is, the wage is not, working wage is not increasing so much um so this is the yeah uh, i wanted to show but i guess you're not looking at it so i would give you the information that the uh, uh from 1984 to 2019 that the uh enormous number of, of uh, workers uh choosing the the uh, growth of the uh, non regular workers is increasing. Non regular workers meaning part time, temporary agency worker. So those do not have a job security. And for instance, in 1984, 84.7% of uh, uh, labor force has a regular job. In 19, sorry, to 2019, only 61.7% have a the uh, job security, the uh, uh, the employment with job security. So that the huge difference in the uh, uh, labor market in Japan. So that Japan used to be that the uh, highest job security uh, country. So has the uh, stability of family and stability of uh, uh, employment. And now that Japan is facing uh, sort of much more insecure uh, employment and insecure family obligation. And uh, so that's the, uh, so uh, the last topic 
uh, I was preparing was the impact of COVID-19 on Japanese women workers. And the, uh, so a shame that the uh, uh, you don't you're not able to I'm not able to sh show the figures, but the uh, uh, the survey shows that the uh, contract workers and the uh, oh, the uh, wanted to show that the female workers more likely to be uh, influenced by the COVID. And then uh, looking at, uh, more closely, we see that the uh, non, uh, female non-regular workers lost a job and the uh, increased the number of women, uh, the non-regular uh, women, uh, the uh, showing the high unemployment. So it really uh, showing that uh, Jap the non-regular workers, uh, non-regular female workers are most vulnerable and they are uh, suffering from poverty and the uh, some of them are single mom. So that's not only that uh, uh, women are suffering from the poverty, but the uh, uh, next generation, the child poverty uh, is the highest among OECD countries. Um, the uh, the other thing is just the uh, uh, I think the, this discussion we talked about the uh, teleworking uh, is very important uh, for women has a lots of possibilities. For instance, like we were doing a webinar, and the uh, so we were able to connect uh, even though we were in different places and then also like a COVID-19 so y your risk is lower by using teleworking but the uh, m more men and the regular workers and the uh, managerial position so high uh, income uh, workers uh, tend to use teleworking, but the uh, women who really need the uh, uh, teleworking are not usually uh, using it. So there are some sort of disparities of uh, introduction of uh, teleworking uh, by gender. So then I think the last slide I was preparing that uh, so the larger the corporation, more likely to introduce teleworking. And uh, today I was listening to the another seminar was saying that overall about 27% of the employees are now using uh, teleworking. So which is the, an, a huge growth, uh, but yet 70% are not uh, using teleworking and the environment by using uh, teleworking are not really well um, sort of um, established yet in Japan. So uh, in the future, the, I think the COVID-19 is the uh, great opportunity uh, for the society to see the real situation of women in Japan, that uh, not only women uh, uh, sort of excluded from the uh, core workforce, but also women are suffering from uh, poverty. And the uh, also the domestic violence is another issue uh, that uh, uh, there was a telephone service uh, uh, introduced during COVID-19. And so women can call and uh, tell so what's going on. And the uh, number of uh, telephone calls has been increasing during COVID-19 because the whole family is at home. So <laughs> there's a high risk of uh, some of the families. So I think it's just the uh, uh, Japan experience, the rapid economic growth, and the uh, has a lot of uh, good uh, merit of uh, I don't know, stable families and high economic growth. But now we were in the uh, post-industrial uh, uh, society and uh, facing global competition and much more insecure uh, environment uh, that the, uh, we need to change the strategy to uh, include more women 
into the economy. And then uh, we have to have a strategy to uh, use um, sort of like a diversity, diversified workforce, create innovation and create the profits. I think that as Ms. Sasaki mentioned, uh, and the, uh, there's a plenty evidence in Japan showing that the uh, uh, those uh, companies who use as much equal employment opportunities uh, between men and women, but has higher probability, uh, higher pro uh, profitability than the other companies. So I think that uh, we've been discussing today that the uh, mainstreaming gender uh, into the system, into the uh, Japanese system is uh, the key for success in the 21st century of Japan. And then also, I think, in South Africa as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Osawa. So um, it's, it's a pity that um, the slides that you had prepared didn't advance, but this is a perfect way, actually, for, for finishing off um, our discussion um, today, uh, because um, you have uh, very um, concisely um, analyzed um, the uh, context um, in Japan, but at the same time showing, of course, that even though the Japanese context is unique, that there are also um, structural challenges, such as the fact that um, there is um, disparity in the employment system or in the employment structure, and that, that women tend to be the ones that, that are usually in um, in uh, temporary employment or contract employment and, and how that just multiplies into um, further adverse conditions um, uh, for women. Um, so uh, I'm conscious of the time that um, we have extended our time now. And um, there, there are a few questions that, that had um, uh, been posted, um, but I, I think that uh, at this point, I would just like to uh, wrap up to, to thank all of the um, the speakers. Uh, it, it was it was a job to get all of these um, formidable persons um, uh, together for for one webinar, and um, we are extremely honoured that that um, these uh, all of the speakers um, uh, uh, gave their their time. Um, so when I.